Yo, 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 what's up all you burner stoners and potheads? This is Weedman420 with the Weedman420 Chronicles. How are all you... That's all, folks. Vipers doing out there. Uh-oh. What does that have to say about the show? Mrs. Weedman. Mr. Weedman. How the hell are you? Doing all right. Doing all right? Doing all right. I love it. Hey, all you vipers out there in the world, hopefully you're smoking some big fat doinks while you're listening to the show. And we're about to get normal. And we're going to smoke some chem dog grown by our friend Big Earl. And I got some information finally on some on, on a strain to talk about. So chem dog with the near even balance between sativa and indica, 4555, chem dog delivers on both fronts. A clear cerebral high drives creativity with a stony, sleepy body high, fights insomnia, and relaxes the muscles. The strain has THC levels up to 19%, meaning it's more potent than most. It has a powerful spicy plant that like taste and smell with a hint of diesel. The aroma alone can alert Snoopy neighbors to even a carefully concealed pot grow. Not surprisingly, ChemDog is used to produce sour diesel, one of the world's most popular strains. Little is known about ChemDog's history or genetics, which we've had some people on the show to talk about it. And Mrs. Wee Man is dying right now off that it. hit. <laughs> so, yes, there, there is some history now. We've had uh, uh, DJ Kush talk about it. We've had Nick from uh, uh, Magic Beans talk about the history. And there's, there is history about it now. But uh, the urban legend involving the Grateful Dead concert, a handful of seeds and a grower named ChemDog, best for anxiety and pain. The strain is also helpful with depression and ADHD, as well as migraines, arthritis, and PMS. Dry mouth and dry eyes are possible when using this strain, while other side effects are less likely. ChemDog is most popular in the West Coast, in Nevada, and Colorado. It is possibly to find uh, on the traditional market. Um, a lot of growers you see have uh, different strains and crosses that I've seen with it lately, so which is pretty dope. So I like Chem Dog a lot. It is uh, it is rocking. I've, 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 every time I've ever smoked it, it's really good for euphoria. Really makes me happy, 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 relaxing, and creative. Uh, some relief of the symptoms are bipolar disorder, chronic pain, depression, insomnia, loss of appetite, migraines, nausea, PTSD, and stress. Uh, just so you know, the 19% I read, this is what the writer about this strain said. I know we see higher strains out there now. This was an older, older written, um, description of the strain. Um, loss of appetite, migraines, nausea, PTSD, and stress. Flavors are chemical, diesel, and pine, and aromas are diesel, earthy, and pungent. It's pungent. It is pungent. I smoked it last night. On the I smoked it last night on the show, uh, on the Grower show, and I ripped like four or five hits, and I was pretty good for a little bit on that. <laughs> I might have had more than that. Um. So, Miss Wee Man, pass that J over to <laughs> me, go. and Mrs. Wee Man is going to talk about our great week we had last week with a. We felt like young adults again it felt normal we saw two shows in a row yeah. like we haven't done that in a while like mm -hmm. see back like thursday and saturday shows i mean we're not young chickens anymore and <laughs> yeah but th okay so we saw run the jewels at the mm. at the salt shed rtj rtj and so they performed for four nights they have four albums each night they did they played through a full album and it was a great show um I wouldn't say like intimate setting, but it was at the Salt Shed in Chicago and maybe like, what is that? Like a 2,000, maybe 3,000 person? No, I would say about venue? two. Yeah. And it wasn't jam-packed. It no, was really it was nice. Fun show. They played great. Um, lots I'm, of weed smoke. Yeah, lots of weed smoke. <laughs> I'm failing to remember the opening uh, DJ's uh, name. But so the, the uh, company Flow, of, which yes. was LP's first first, uh, band first, or uh, first gig. Art, yeah, first art uh, hip hop group. So yeah, and he jammed yeah. some great old school hip hop. It was awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. We had a great time. Yeah. And that show was good. They, um, my favorite song, one of my favorite songs from them is on that album. It's not my favorite album, RTJ Two, but one of my favorite songs is on that album. Um, but uh, I, 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 I do have it to say fun. they threw a great, they threw down hard. And then Saturday, Saturday we went to see. Nobody really knew what to expect. Um, I picked this concert. I knew about it uh, back in the spring, and decided that we were just going, whether anybody wanted to or not. So I bought four tickets, and uh, my sister had been wanting to go to a show with us. So my sister and my niece came with us, and we went to see Closey. So she is a French DJ, 
uh, electronic music, but kind of she dis- like describes herself as being like soul energetic, kind of not trippy, but it gets kind of like vibey. it gets very vibey. Yeah. And so like- she she had three openers. So she was this week like releasing her set her uh, the set times and who went on at, in what order in each location. And so she didn't come on until what, 1215, I think. Doors opened at like nine. Everybody played for an hour. So she was awesome. And before her was Daily Bread, Ugh. and we fell in love because he uh, he's electro was hip hop, super bassy. Ugh. It was so great, and threw some old school yeah. hip hop classics into his electro music, and it was it was kind of nice because awesome. it was kind of like a progression. Uh, the first two guys led into um, Daily Bread. He got like super down, and then Closey brought it back. Like she started off with her heavy hitters, and then just kind of brought it back down to. Like a real groovy vibe. Vibe-y. It was right. really great. And then she great banged lights. it out. Then she banged it out. Yeah, at the end. And she had great lights. Oh my god, the light show was great. Radius does place. a good job with their lights. Yeah, we were at Radius yeah, for that one. Their light show there was, was um, fantastic. Amazing. And uh I packed about eight joints, <laughs> ten joints <laughs> for that a show. Lot. My niece and my sister smoke a lot. Yeah, they smoke a we lot. We smoke a good amount. Between, I think we each essentially we had were out, more than a joint. We were out in the smoking section, which is outside, <laughs> yeah. uh, if you want to call it that. <laughs> <laughs> they put us out with the dumpsters. Yeah, they put us with the rats. And <laughs> uh, there was three people sitting on uh, these these stoops, and they were trying to stuff a joint, and they were having problems. And uh, I walked over with a joint, and I said, here you go. You looks like you're having problems, so you can have one of mine. <laughs> and they were like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, take it. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm feeling your pain right now, watching you trying to fill this joint up right now. <laughs> so they were so happy, so excited. And then we went back out again. Uh, we went and saw a little bit more show, went back out to smoke another joint. And there was three people behind us and we were really stoned as it was probably didn't need that fourth or fifth joint. No. And, uh, but we smoked about half it and there was three people behind us. I'm like, you want to partake? And they're like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, this they were is... really happy about that. Oh yeah. They were very happy. They're so like, really like yeah. have it. Not just like a hit. And we're like, Take no, it. finish it. Finish it. And we're we like, are, I mean, great. and then because we were hitting the pen inside, I mean, we were, oh my God. we were baked. And I ate an edible before we left too. So I was <laughs> feeling no pain. And this 51 year old, both 51 year olds sitting across from me, uh, made it to the front of the stage. <laughs> we made our way through. We did. And it was great to, uh, for a daily bread. And then went took a smoke break and then went back during closing. Made it to the front and we danced and danced like it was 1999. It was we, fun. We were, we were banging with the best of them. So, and the next morning when I woke up Sunday morning, we didn't get home till like 3 30 in the morning. Yeah, it was late. Yeah. We had to go get some fried shrimp. Yeah, from Lawrence Fisheries. We had some foodies. Yeah, we got we some foodies hungry. from Lawrence Fisheries. It was great. If you've never been to Lawrence Fisheries on Cermak and Canal, you are missing out. If you yeah. like fried shrimp and hush puppies go and good light, French fries. Lightly breaded. Yeah, lightly breaded is the, the they ticket. They have regular, they have lightly breaded. Yes. Mm. Classic uh, Chicago good staple. Good French fries. Oh, and they were hot. They're always yeah. hot, their fries. And they put these crunchy. It's Crunchies. like they dread. Ugh. I think they do like a really light flour dredge. It's amazing. And fry them, but then the ins they're thick enough, the cut, that they're like my mouth is watering. It's like they're <laughs> like a mashed potato, like a creamy mashed potato on the inside when you bite into them. Yeah. Oh my god. They were delicious. <sighs> Those are so good. And then we got home. Shoot, I'm gonna want them. <laughs> then we got mm. home, and these two old timers were in bed <laughs> about four fifteen in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Sunday came, and we had lunch brunch pr- plans with the kiddos, and in the city, so and, we and, had to drive. And I was not happy about it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I was so happy to see our kids and have brunch. Don't get me wrong, but I was not happy getting up when we had to get yeah. up. Oh, I, look at baby yawn. <laughs> <laughs> I was having like a flashback. <laughs> we were. I was. I. I, I, I as soon as we got done oh eating, God. we where did we go to? We went to Ina May's yes, uh, on, tavern. Uh, wood off of Milwaukee. Yeah. And delicious place. New Orleans and style food. And they had food. like a, uh, they had a jazz band. brunch. Yeah, so was, there, were two piece, there was a two-piece jazz band. Amazing. It wasn't overly packed. But they when had, I got done eating that coffee. food. Their coffee was good. The coffee wasn't bad. It wasn't like amazing, but it was it solid. It wasn't bad. But the food we had was delicious. Yeah. But once we ate that food, it oh all gosh. came tumbling down for me. You were done. And we had to go, We went walking a little yeah. bit, which was great. I'm glad we did because I was so full. 
but the, my world crashed. Well, all I want, okay. all I wanted to do was go lay down, and go sleep. Ah, oh, boo boo, <laughs> you can't hang. Come on, hey, one night. Hey, you forgot I worked eight hours that Saturday so too. Did I? I worked eight hours standing up in the hot sun. Okay. <laughs> One to party night. till four o'clock One in the night. morning. To One party night. with you till four o'clock in the morning. Wow. High five. High fives. High fives. We did it. High fives. We did it. It's really not a big deal. <laughs> no, because I could probably do you it again. You should try it sometime if you don't do it. I could probably do it again it's this fun. Saturday. <laughs> yeah, right? Why not? <laughs> so Sleep some but, other time. Yeah, I'll get all the sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. That's right. But it was so much fun. Hanging out with Mrs. Wee Man and friends and family and just jamming like we were when we were younger. It was great. It's good to like just be able to do that every once in a while and go live for today, right? Yeah, I was trying to convince my niece. She's 21. And I'm like, okay, have you been to one of these concerts before? No. Okay. Do you want, like, have you, like, just at any show, like, just really gotten into the music? She's like, ah, oh. Like, I don't know if she knew what I meant. I'm like, okay. It's really special if you can get yourself as close as possible to the stage and in the middle of the pack and just don't care. Drop your inhibitions. Just be in your space get high and dance just feel the music and move and don't give a shit about who's around she you. did not come with us we got there we started to get there i'm like come on if you're not comfortable we'll back out we'll go back so we we're standing like maybe 10 15 rows off of stage but to the right like where the big crowd of people ended we were like the first people off of that maybe she would like not a couple go to the middle she was not yeah not we, we got maybe a third of the way in and then i looked at her and i'm like no She's like, no, <laughs> not feeling it. I was like, damn, I really wanted her to experience it. Man, I got, but, you know, I got right. in there. I was like, oh, this oh, is great. I just great. love it. Yeah, the I bass. Love it. Yeah, so go to a show. Have some fun, will you? Let your hair down. <laughs> Get loose. Yeah. Dance weird. Who fucking cares? Just fucking just go. be Just be you. I mean, that's all it's about. That's what's so fun about it. Yep, yep. You don't even really, I don't even know what anybody looked like around me. You're was, like in a groove too, with everybody, but at one point, was there even people there? I don't know. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, there was some guy like wiggling around, like on the floor. Oh yeah, and that floor was gross. That floor was there gross. Was so I'm much, like, what is like, he doing? There was so much liquid and he was so feet, happy, though. muddy, like from people's he shoes. He was on drugs. Whatever. Probably not weed. No, definitely, <laughs> definitely not weed. Definitely not weed. Because weed's not a drug, in. so he wasn't on weed. I don't know what he was on, but it was very weird what he was doing. He was doing the he was doing the weed is a medicine. He was doing the alligator on the floor a few times, <laughs> <laughs> and the, he wasn't really alone. There were some other people getting people. down low with yeah. him, right? No, but like he they was were on into the what floor. He was, doing. he was laying on the he was floor, on the floor doing like, the alligator. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it looked wow, like to me. Dude, you need to get up. <laughs> I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. But uh, I was thinking it. Yeah, it it, uh, it was weird for a second there. It but got, it was, it but got it was a little strange. But was like, all right, well, I mean, whatever. He's happy. Oh, uh, you ready to get the show started? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do this. What is Pitella? Pitella. I was talking to somebody at a dispensary. I don't know about a month ago, and he had mentioned if I had tried Pitella or had heard of it. I'm like, I have not tried it. And I know it's a form of hash, but don't know much about it. So I I did some reading and I did some research and I just want to know more about it. So if you've heard of it or if you've not heard of it, this is what Pitella is. Pitella is making waves in a major way. You might have seen some pictures. You might have seen some memes. But supposedly this is the next level sovereignless and it's blowing some people's minds and rightfully so. The potency and flavor of this artfully crafted solventless cannabis concentrate is truly legendary. So what is Pitella and where does it come from? And I only know of one place in in, in, in the United States that you can get this right now. It's somewhere. It's a, a dispensary in Florida. So I've been told. I, I could be wrong. Uh, in northeastern Spain, the region of Catalonia is known for the lively beach resorts of Costa Brava as well as Pyrenees Mountains. Cannabis culture has deep roots in the regional capital. Barcelona, where connoisseurs have been producing and consuming hash in high esteem for decades. It seems that Pitel is the newest creation born from this fabled region. But is there anything new under the sun? Hash heads, who would definitely know, have recently called Pitella some of the very best hash in the world. So what exactly is Pitella, and how do you make it? Pitella's six-star fresh frozen bubble hash, and I'm going to read a little bit about uh, the six-star fresh frozen bubble hash next. 
It's both washed and cured to preserve resin in a unique and truly special way. When talking about premium solventless concentrate that requires expert care in both cultivation and extraction, Pytella showcases the unadulterated magic of loose resin through a cold curing process. Pytella is a fusion of in, uh, innovative cold curing with traditional methods of hash making. It's full melt, six-star hash on a whole different level. You can cut it with a knife, and it has the consistency almost like a soft fudge. Ooh. It's firm enough to maintain its overall shape, even when cut into pieces, and won't liquefy or drip off of the knife. Any cannabis product that's left to cure in the open air is prone to rapid oxidation, a natural process that both degrades terpene and cannabinoid content and darkens the resin. While varying degrees of oxidation are inevitable, uh, over time, less oxidation is always the goal. Pytella is so special in part because of the cold curing process that drastically minimizes the rate of oxidation. This allows Pytella to maintain the light color of the original resin. To me, it looks like um, it looks. Uh, I'm looking at a picture of it. It looks like cut like chicken breast, <laughs> the way they cut it in this picture. But the inside of it does look like fudge. <laughs> is Pytella just a new uh, iteration of the Temple Ball? Seeing videos of Pytella uh, presented in transparent glu uh, cellulose film definitely looks like the Temple Balls that Frenchie Cannoli made famous. Temple Balls give hash makers a way to store and preserve precious trichome heads for long term. However, long term aging is not the goal of Pytella. The aim of Pytella is to capture the freshness of the resin just as the trichomes begin to cure and terpenes explode at peak expression. Terpenes in Pytella can sometimes bleed right out of the hash reminiscent of cold cure rosin with puddles of liquid terps throughout. The hash isn't heated and pressed like rosin, though. It just expert, it's just expertly cured. Wrapped in plant-based cellulose film, the key is in the cold cure, an absence of fresh air which would speed up the oxidation. One key difference between Temple Balls and Pytella is that Temple Balls require a heat and pressure, like a wine bottle with high, hot water, to pop the trichome and release all the resin out of the encapsulation. Hash makers roll a wine bottle filled with hot water over loose resin to lightly press the trichomes before rolling it into a ball for curing and aging. All the compounds in the trichome head, uh, including the, uh, the, the cut seal itself, chemically interact during the aging process to create something new. In contrast, Pytella keeps the trichome heads completely intact and simply allows it to slow cold cure over time in a controlled environment while minimizing oxidation. There's no <coughs> heating involved. Is Pytella really the best hash in the world? Frenchie Cannoli uh, made a great analogy. Some people like to drink orange juice, where other people like to eat the full orange. We can we can think that about rosin like orange juice that is extracted from the full orange, which is the hash. Who can say that orange juice is better than the whole orange? It's all a matter of personal personal preference, and both answers can be correct. Pytella is different experience, and that's how uh, to think about cold cured hash. It's just simply diff uh, different from an expertly crafted end product. There is, there's no best. It just comes down to the connoisseur's preference. I'm gonna, we're gonna post this article because it tells you how to make it. I'm not gonna read about it. You can read it yourself if you want to learn how to make it. But something cool uh, by Mark Twain: History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Following some of the principles used to making Temple Balls, Pytella's freshly frozen bubble hash of highest quality preserved and cured with extra care and attention. With cold temperatures and drastically limited exposure to air, the resin of Pytella is both preserved and enhanced. The result is a transcendent cannabis concentrate and what many are seeing as the next level of innovation in hash. So uh, just to note what six-star full melt hash is, if you don't know, six-star hash refers to loose resin of the highest quality uh, possible quality. This is premium quality solventless, and it's actually quite hard to come by. You're not going to find true six-star hash in dispensaries. A lot of things have to go right in order to create the best of the best, and only one thing has to go wrong to destroy it, in order to destroy it. At the same time, the only job of the hash maker is not to mess up what the cannabis plant is, has already produced. Six-star hash is a result of flawless isolation, collection and preservation of top quality resin within the trichome heads of the cannabis plant. Full melt is another expression used to describe six star hash, which reflects as the ability of the purest of hash to fully melt away after dabbing without leaving any waxy residue behind. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So 
That's a little bit about uh, about the six stars. And hash is rated from one to six stars, with one being the lowest quality and six being the highest quality. Um, hash makers use a, a process called ice water extraction, which we've talked about, to loosen the resin to create bubble hash, the method of washing hash. It uses ice-cold water to separate trichome heads from the cannabis on which the glow, the grow puts a series of uh, sieving bags to isolate and collect these heads, which we've read about in the past. Trichome heads contain high concentrations of the most desirable therapeutic compounds that cannabis produces, which is why it makes them so very valuable to solventless extraction artists. These heads are often referred to collectively as resin, the top prize of hash makers. So that's just a little bit more. It starts with genetics, don't forget. Uh, and then cultivation is a labor of love when it comes to growing, of course, and then also genetics and then also making hash. It is a labor of love. And then harvesting um, process to create six star hash. Follow, there's, there's so many different ways to do it. Like be gentle. Uh, trichomes are easily bruised and damaged. Don't jostle the buds around. Handle the plant by the stems and branches only. Don't grip onto the flowers themselves. So you can learn more. We'll post both both of these because uh, this talk it talks about freezing, it talks about extraction, it talks about drying, it talks about a lot. So uh, we'll post both of those articles so you can read if you're interested about learning or even trying it yourself because they give examples on how to do your own hash. Do we have a modern day bathroom? We do. We do. In some regards. In some regards? Yeah. What kind of products do we find in our modern-day bathroom? Well, I've got five essential cannabis products for the modern bathroom. And there's, there are really a good variety of products. I personally think there should be more. Um, but anyway, uh, weed lace lotions and beauty potions are infiltrating medicine cabinets and bathroom vanities everywhere. Here are some products worth adding to your collection. Those who use cannabis skincare claim that the hydrating, anti-inflammatory properties save their skin and lips, while beauty experts suggest that cannabis-infused products may help treat skin conditions like psoriasis, eczema, and dry scalp without any psychoactive effects. While most of the information available, information available on the effects of cannabis skincare products is anecdotal, some clinical research by the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology and the National Center for Biotechnology Information exists showing that cannabinoids from cannabis have anti-aging and antioxidant properties. The cannabinoid molecules interact with the endocannabinoid system, which is a network of cell receptors stretching throughout the entire human body to control all kinds of vital functions. These studies also confirm that cannabinoids, especially CBD, are responsible for lipid production and, therefore, help regulate conditions such as dry skin or acne when applied topically. Here are some ideas of products you can look for. Uh, cannabis soaps and soaks. Cannabis seed oil is anti-inflammatory. It helps decrease the activity of oil glands, which may benefit those with acne. Back pain, sore muscles, and joints can all benefit from a scrub with a can cannabinoid-rich soap. Sensamelia. Sensamelia? Mila? Sensamelia? Sensamelia. Sensamelia. A type of weed. <laughs> it's weed without seeds, and it's known for having a being stronger, okay? It's a type of weed uh, with a high level of THC. Will even give you a genuine body buzz. A lot of people in the 70s smoke Sensamelia. Yeah, Sensamelia. Although topical application of most cannabis is non-psychoactive and is safe enough for the whole family. Your choice of soap may contain CBD, THC, or both, but it should also be made of ingredients that are gentle on your skin. Cannabis-infused bath bombs are also being gobbled up by fans of this beauty trend. Warm bath uh, water helps to open pores and allows cannabinoids to get absorbed into your skin for all over relief. Um, how about some lifted lip care? Cannabis lip balm soothes chapped lips and takes away the idea of illegality and stigma. This popular type of cannabis product sheds the stoner association while still giving the user all of the benefits of the plant. Whether or not the balm contains THC, the important thing is that it has CBD oil and other agents that will allow your lips to rebuild their natural oil barrier. Uh, hemp hand protection. I am a 
big uh, advocate of that. Um, hemp lotions are amazing. Um, and the Body Shop in particular has been making a, a hemp hand protector cream for years before it was even cool. And now that beauty editors across the country are hooked on this craze, the product has become the store's bestseller. Cannabis topicals and creams can treat skin problems from dry skin to rheumatoid arthritic flare-ups and sunburns. Uh, cannabis flower fragrances. Apply cannabis fragrance for an earthy and delicate scent that smells less like a dispensary and more like a chic European boutique. Um, Anti-aging potions medicated with cannabis. Look for full-spectrum hemp oil facial moisturizers that use cannabis sativa oil to correct skin while actively protecting it throughout the day. Cannabis seed oil stimulates the skin's natural oil production to keep skin firm. Next time you're in need of new skincare products, try a new cannabis product rather than your usual ones. And I would say, yes. So pr I probably had that hemp balm from Body Shop as one of my very early first oh, yeah. hemp products. Yeah, I used um, it. <laughs> yeah. And then from there, I was taking like a hemp supplement for a little bit. And I was like, oh, I th really think that this hemp, like my body really is in tune with hemp. It likes it. So then I found a full body lotion now. I like that stuff too. It's cannabis. And then I have, for a few years, we've been using uh, three different brand, face, face stuff. With yeah, hemp in it. it's the brand. Um, well, Alba is my favorite skincare, like drugstore, cosmetic uh, store, um, uh, like lotion product, cl cleansing product, body care product line. Um, so Alba has a cannabis line. I like that one. It's not Mr. Weedman's favorite. I like the smell. We uh, also have used uh, Canacel is a line That's from the shit. yes from Andalou. And Andalou you can buy in like Whole Foods. Sometimes you'll find it in Target. It's super hit or miss. Um, Alba for sure you can find Target, Walgreens, and all that. But the Andalou uh, Canacel is supposed to be cannabis sativa stem cell mm -hmm. um that is in all the products they're very nice very nice i use their face wash their toner and then their their cream for after i shave yep so i've been using that out two make years shampoo conditioner body lotion two, maybe even longer than two years i yeah. think about like maybe, yeah they have a sunblock when did Polly come home 19 that's when we started using it yeah yeah like right around there so I, I I do like that product. 18? It's not that Alba is a is a bad product. No, he's got I home in eighteen. I, yeah, yeah, I think it was so 18. eighteen. We've been using that. Uh, I like Alba is a great product. I just don't like the smell of it. It just the cannabis lotion. It just got a weird smell to it. it just the, the face stuff. No, the body the body stuff. Uh, the face stuff is fine. The body stuff the body lotion. It doesn't bother me when it. Yeah, I, I like it. After it's on, yeah, I don't it's smell on. it. Yeah. But once you like have it, like when you squirt it out of the bottle, it's just it's just really strong. So, but it's good stuff. It works well. Whatever. No, oh, don't get mad at me. <laughs> I like the products. <laughs> I'm growing a Landry strain right now. Yeah, you are. Um, and uh, I'll post a picture on Friday. I do have to go out of town for a couple of days, so Mrs. Wee Man's gonna have to take care of the babies for a couple of days. You know, uh, as growing a, my first like true like. Landry strain that Big Earl gave me. It's ice queen haze and, and uh, Landry strain together. So he, he bred them together. So or ice queen, yeah, or ice queen haze. So I'm excited. Uh, he's been working through with me. I, 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 uh, the thing that sucks is my humidifier broke. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I ordered one right away. It's supposed to be here tomorrow. Uh, I have water all over the place in the tent. I've been spraying stuff down. Yeah. So it's already the first week of my plants in. Uh, early in, in baby in, in baby veg and uh i'm already having issues <laughs> but so the, here's some landry strains and with some ch with some status here so cannabis was originally a wild plant like we've talked about growing like a weed in its natural environment seeds from these uh from landry strains traveled with nomadic tribes to new locations where the plant was coveted for its many benefits landry's cannabis strains are full indica and sativa the parents of any modern hybrid the road tra uh, tracking hybrid strains back to their origins generally end at one of these cannabis plants, Acapulco Gold, also known as Mexican Sativa. This is one of the most well-known pure Sativa Landry strains. Acapulco Gold is from Mexico and is believed to have gained popularity in the States in the 60s. It's also well-known for its potency and uplifting effects. It's said to have a sweet scent of woody uh, flavor. 
Afghani, also known as Afghan, Afghan Kush, or Afghanistan weed. Uh, uh, choose Afghani from the Hindo Kush mountain range for a deeply relaxing experience. It is apparent to the prominent indicas like OG Kush and Blueberry. Ooh, Blueberry. Afghani has a skunk uh, patchouli aroma and flavor. Colombian Gold, also known as Santa Marta Colombian Gold. The treasure was found in the Santa Marta Mountains of Colombia before making its way to the States. The uplifting sativa from South America is uh, beloved by those who seek a straightforward, focused effect. Colombian Gold is a pan of Skunk One with the familiar uh, flavor and aroma of Skunky Lemon. Durban Poison. When it comes to coveted uh, sativa strains, Durban Poison Open makes the list. Handling from South Africa, the zesty lemon cannabis variety could be compared to a cup of coffee with a psychedelic twist. Hawaiian Duckfoot. The Landis strain features leaves sharp uh, longer than uh, with fronds, fronds close together resembling a duck foot. These strains derive from Hawaii where many say it grows best. Those lucky enough to find Hawaiian duck foot nugs can expect a wave of chill accompanied by giggly joy. The jar will smell like passion fruit and skunk with a taste to match. Hindu Kush, also known as Hindi Kush. From the Hindi Kush mountainous uh, region comes Hindu Kush, an aptly named indica with uh, hard-hitting effects. Ooh. The earthly scents of pine and skunk come together in a nug that many say yield, uh, yield solid quantities of hash. Jarilla Sonola, also known as Mexican Jarilla Sonola, another of the co coveted Landry strains. Jarilla Sonola is indigenous to the Sonola region of Mexico. The high is described as energetic, motivated, and stimulating. The terpene profile represents of a bowl of citrus fruits. Lamb's bread, also known as lamb's breath or lamb's bread. Many know uh, this is a reggae legend Bob Marley's favorite cannabis strain. Lamb's bread is thought to come from Jamaica, but the precise lineage isn't clear. What is clear is the legit green nugs with the brown orange pistols that it grows. Creative energetic effects are prominent with the coveted cannabis Landry strains. Maui Wowie. Landry strains, another one of the uh, Landry strains from Hawaii. Maui Wowie boasts full sativa effects. Chunky, sticky buds are complemented by sweet guava mango aroma. Uh, Panama Red, also known as Red Weed Strain, originated in South America. Panama Red got its name from the bright red hairs growing all over its chunky green buds. And then uh, chocolate tie, the sativa Landry strain once considered synonymous to the tie stick. However, chocolate tie has unique characteristics that has been separated out as its own Landry genetics. So Landry strains, for thousands of years, cannabis plants have been minding their own business in the natural environments. It's only in the last century that humans concern themselves with labeling cannabinoids, identifying terpenes, and determining the legality of everything in between. While the cannabis industry can feel complicated and nuanced, focused on the latest hype strains and boasting exotic weed, coming back to where it all started can breathe a breath of fresh air. The list, uh, this list that I talked about, is strains from around the world, and it's, we need uh, to get back to the basics of these strains. I would like to smoke all of them. Give them to me. <laughs> <laughs> Gas station weed. Ew. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've talked about this a few times because there's just so much confusion. How come I can buy weed at a gas station if I'm supposed to go to a dispensary and it says that it's THC, but it's at 7-Eleven? So why is that, right? Are you suddenly seeing Delta 9 THC products on the shelves in bars, gas stations, or convenience stores near you? Since when has 7-Eleven been a dispensary? Is the product on display even similar to what's sold in a licensed cannabis dispensary? The current confusion can be traced back to one key moment in the battle for legal cannabis, the 2018 Farm Bill. That landmark piece of legislation legalized the manufacturing of products derived from hemp, a cousin of the cannabis plant that doesn't deliver the same potent intoxicating effect when smoked but does include many of the same chemicals or cannabinoids. The Farm Bill allowed a framework for the legal sale of hemp-derived products, like CBD oils, but also inadvertently created a gray market for intoxicating substan substances due to the fact that, though manipulating the hemp plant, it's entirely possible to create byproducts that do very similar things as cannabis when smoked or ingested. Though many consumers associate hemp with CBD, hemp can be bred to have higher levels of intoxicating THC, 
just as cannabis can be bred to contain more CBD or any of the other naturally occurring cannabinoids it produces, like CBG, CBC, and CBN. Then there is the matter of synthetic cannabinoids, like Delta-8 THC, THCO, THCP, and more. These don't technically violate federal laws, drug laws that is, because they don't contain the specific intoxicant in cannabis that makes it illegal, Delta-9 THC. While old-fashioned cannabis-derived Delta-9 THC, so not hemp plant, cannabis plant, uh, is gated into regulated adult use and medicinal dispensaries. These synthetic hemp-derived products may be available anywhere toilet paper and slushies are sold, and there seem to be more of them every year, including products containing hemp-derived Delta-9 THC. If you're confused, trust me, you're not alone. So, hemp versus cannabis. There's a new rush to provide compliant Delta-9 THC to consumers who want access to the intoxicating effects of THC, but they don't live in a state that has legalized recreational use. With this loophole of supposed federal legality, everyone from the local mini-mart, fancy grocers, to online retailers have started stocking cannabinoids of all sorts, provided they can prove the products came from hemp or a lab and not from the cannabis plant. Some brands are taking hemp-derived extracts and using a lab process to make Delta-8 THC, a similar cannabinoid to cannabis's naturally occurring Delta-9 THC. But some brands aren't synthesizing THC alternatives, and instead, they're collecting naturally occurring Delta-9 THC from hemp plants. Can I say something real quick? Yeah. There was a big thing in Missouri. I think I'm, I don't know if I read it already or if I'm reading it today or if I read it and I haven't talked about it yet, but a lot of dispensaries and a lot of, didn't know they were getting hemp <laughs> Delta nine derived Delta nine. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I just read it. <laughs> well, because there isn't much natural Delta nine THC in industrial hemp, they need to process huge quantities of the plant to create products with intoxicating effects. They can do this legally, though, as long as they are working with hemp containing less than 0.3% THC on a dry weight basis. This dry weight language makes it very easy for manufacturers to produce products like vapes and edibles, since there are no guidelines in placing governing on how much dry cannabis can be used to create them. <laughs> the loophole! loophole. <laughs> <laughs> According to Dr. Peter Grinspoon, a cannabis expert and author, there's a key difference between hemp producers and cannabis purveyors. Quote, While in theory, they do the same thing and act in the same way, in legal states, cannabis-derived Delta-9 products are regulated carefully by the state. So you know exactly what you're getting and exactly what you're not getting, he said. No fungus, no heavy metals, no lead, no pesticides. Whereas the hemp-derived Delta-9 extracts, just like all of the other extracts from hemp, are completely unregulated. That's key. Uh, plant science. There's already a research gap between, I'm sorry, with both cannabis and hemp. We don't understand the full extent of how their cannabinoids operate in our bodies. That's why many argue there should be more scrutiny on nationally offered cannabinoid products, regardless of their source. I think that even if in theory hemp-derived Delta-9 THC is the same molecule that in practice it is much more dangerous due to the lack of regulation, Grinspoon said. He likens the current synthetic cannabinoid boom to a sort of wild west of synthetic compounds. Due to the lack of rules and regulations, companies can claim to be selling only natural, quote-unquote, hemp-derived Delta-9 THC, while not stating that they also contain synthetic cannabinoids or other herbs meant to increase feelings of intoxication. Not only is this not safe for the consumer's health, it overshadows the potential for cannabis to be a balanced part of someone's life or even <coughs> a valid medical treatment and not just a way to get high. Grinspoon says to be wary. 
You're getting all these novel minor cannabinoids that are being marketed and exploited, some of which may ultimately show medicinal value, but they need a lot more safety testing. Given again how completely unrelated the whole industry is and how inflated the marketing claims are, I think it's become, and that was unregulated the industry is, and how inflated the claims are, I think it's become quite dangerous. I'm a huge believer in legal, regulated drugs with sensible regulation. So let's explain. Did you think so? Oh, I thought maybe Mr. Weedman was going to say something. I was going to say something. He's what? a huge believer in legal, regulated cannabis, maybe he should mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Let's explain hemp-derived Delta 9 THC. Brands are processing huge amounts of naturally grown hemp-derived Delta 9 THC to avoid the synthetic label. And this is probably your best bet for accessing Delta 9 THC from somewhere other than cannabis. You'll already get small amounts of full, you already get small amounts in full spectrum CBD products, which meet the 0.3% THC requirements of farm bill compliance. But to get near the potent buzz of cannabis derived Delta 9, you'll need to research brands and products thoroughly to understand what you are getting. It's not, or it is worth noting that adult use dispensaries are not scooping up hemp derived Delta 9 products to offer to their customers. Even as popular cannabis brands begin to offer hemp derived formulations of their products to direct to consumer on a national scale. I asked J.M. Balbuena, author and managing partner of San Diego's Jack's Cannabis, an adult use legal dispensary, for more insight into this nuance. And she notes, from a consumer standpoint, while flour remains the dominant product in the cannabis market, hemp-derived Delta 9 THC has the potential to impact the infused edible sector. If these developments prove anything, it's that people want access to cannabis, and no one is sure if those willing to fill that need with hemp and synthetics are helping or hurting this access just yet. Education is a significant factor here, Balbuena said. Consumers need more information to trust that hemp-derived Delta 9 THC can offer effects comparable to those of cannabis-derived Delta 9 THC. Read that one more time. Yes. Uh, consumers need more information to trust that hemp-derived Delta 9 THC can offer effects comparable to those of cannabis-derived Delta 9 THC. Moreover, customer service representatives at convenience stores and smoke shops will also need proper education to guide consumers effectively. Well, how do you know if your hemp-derived Delta 9 THC products are even safe? Unfortunately, that's a difficult question to answer. What's most important is knowing what you're consuming. Quality brands provide a certificate of analysis, or a COA, to certify what's in their products. If you're cautious, you can stick to naturally derived Delta 9 THC, whether it comes from hemp or cannabis plants. Without action from the federal government, these loopholes will only con cause confusion to proliferate. Meanwhile, cannabis advocates like Grinspoon just want to ensure product safety. It's the illegality of cannabis in certain states that is making people sick from unregulated hemp products, he said. Please take the time to learn about what you're consuming and spending your money on. That was a very good article. Yeah. And we've it's talked just, about we've just talked so about so much confusion. Yeah, and we've talked about the gas stations before and I listen. If they could sell it fine, I would like I said I would never buy it from a gas station, especially not seeing what the COAs are and stuff like that and all the good stuff and bad stuff that comes along with what you're buying at a gas station, you know, when you, I used to love being a kid going in the bathrooms and buying the, the cologne out of the machines and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And the <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Oh, a lot of thought in the last, since I read this article and, um, a lot of stoner thoughts, burner thoughts, pothead thoughts ran through my head that I should have wrote down, but I'm going to say this. We this is the article headlines. We don't plan on stopping. Teamsters new cannabis contract in Illinois raises bar for big industry players. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Start forming your own union. 
um, you, you're, you see what's going on right now with the car industry, right? Well, they just laid off 700 people at a Ford plant here in Illinois that wasn't even a part of the whole strike. So what I'm going to suggest and say is this. As you join unions that don't know anything about cannabis and it looks good for them and they're and they're and bringing more members onto the union maybe getting you some more money maybe getting you some of the things that you want my listen i'm not against unions but i'm against unions that don't know the industry that you're in the other thing is if you ever decide to strike and 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 go against the industry, the owners, here's what could happen. That means the states aren't getting their money. So the states now are going to get involved because they're not getting their tax revenue because no one's working. And then what's going to happen is the state's going to re-regulate stuff and then and hire you. You might have to be certified to work in the industry. They might put regulations on, okay, if you want to work in the union and get union wages, then you have to go to be certifi- certified that might cost the state certified. It might cost you $1,500. Now you're upping cost of everything. I'm not blaming you for trying to protect yourselves. But they'll, they'll, they'll come consequences for actions when it becomes to an industry that's young, that's fairly new, not a lot of standards and regulations on the federal level, but on the state levels. And we've seen what the states have done to the cannabis industry. A lot of them have fucked it up so bad to where this can all backfire in all of us. My thoughts on this, I'm not even reading the article. Good for the Teamsters if that's what you if that's what you want to go into and you, the local, you know, uh, contracts in Illinois dispensaries. And I'm not even going to mention any of them. So... To, for that 15% wage increase, is that really what you wanted? Paid meals, uh, successorship clauses of dispensary sold, uh, scheduling based on seniority, uh, right to representation during disciplining matters. It's, that's all fine and good. An end to at-will employment. If that's what you truly wanted, instead of really getting to the nitty-gritty of, of the industry where you need to be a part of ESOPs, like I've said, this is needs to be a, 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 everybody can make money at this. Unions are there to protect you, but I think in this industry, it's not your unions that have been around for a while. I, they may or may not have your best interest. I, I don't know. But if that's what you want... That's fine, but it's not actually what it should really be. Um, I think everybody needs to come together in this industry. Maybe not always kumbaya <laughs> it, but to have the same standards, the same protections, the same fight, the same rights. And I'm not only talking about the workers. I'm also talking about the owners. Because don't forget they're getting screwed too right now. A lot of the mom and pop shops, um, you know, even some of the, the middle corporate companies, you know, um, this is just my opinion. I'm not, I'm not dogging for you to join to wanting to protect yourselves out there. Not at all, but you have to understand something. There will be repercussions and there will be consequences. And I could see States and, and federal government making you all get certified just like a pipe fitter has to do a journeyman two years to work and then you will have to go to school and learn everything about the plant, even though you are getting taught. But it might come down to even more where you have to get safety sanitation. You have to get – it's going to be a lot. So just remember, instead of protecting yourselves, unions are going to protect them first before they protect anything. Start your own union, cannabis people. Um, American Nurses, though, Association formally recognizes cannabis nursing as a specialty practice. Very good. Washington State could okay use of fingerprint scans and facial recognition to buy cannabis and alcohol. Really? Really? Come on now. Uh, Chinese immigrants in the U.S. sue over forced labor at marijuana operations. It's like when they were working on the railroad in California, I guess, right? So, man, come on now. We're better than that. Uh, Nebraska governor and other GOP officials reject call for streamlined marijuana pardon processes. 
But also, I just read though too, there is a, a, a still a fight to try to get it on the ballot for this year, and there's a bunch of people getting uh, getting people to sign up for this ballot for this ballot measure. So, but the Nebraska governor is no friend to cannabis, no friend of the community, no friend to anything, and that's it. So don't look for him for any help when it comes to the pardon processes and trying to get people out of jail. They're still throwing people in jail. Are you kidding me? A lot. Michigan to end marijuana testing for most state government job applicants. Good for you, Michigan. Oh, New York. <laughs> it's just so, so terrible to keep on reading all this disastrous articles and all this disastrous news. <laughs> New York's Cannabis Advisory Board admits it hasn't been doing its job. <laughs> you think? You fucking think? Come on now. And then they're going to turn around and say, New York regulators to issue 1,500 cannabis license in the upcoming round. 1,500. Even Yuki over there is moaning about that <laughs> one. She knows. 1,500 cannabis license in the upcoming you're just about to destroy your whole industry and it hasn't even started yet. And you have you can't even get it off the ground now. You might as well just gave those fucking 1500 licenses to the 1200 bodegas that have been selling it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you really fucked this up, New York, so bad. Just people if you you got home growing in that state, just fucking just learn to grow. Um marijuana ads and free samples in Alaska as new rules take effect. That's cool. I did not realize this Kentucky and you're about to go medical in 2025. Two people charged for pot every hour, every day in Kentucky. Do you wow. understand how much weed is grown in Kentucky? That you don't in some of the some of the finest Kentucky bluegrass I've ever smoked has has come out of Kentucky. The mountain boys up there know how to grow. And I've smoked some really good fire flour in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And you're charging people. And resting two people every hour, it's just fucking absolutely asinine. Oh, my God. And the opinion in, in Kentucky of cannabis, you have more people crossing the Paducah border into Illinois to mm -hmm. Metropolis to buy weed. It's insane. Kind of like just what you see coming from Wisconsin, Iowa, and Indiana. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, over 800 banks file to allow cannabis businesses. The U.S. Department of Treasury is getting hundreds more requests from banking institutions to work with the cannabis business because of the Safe Banking Act. Uh, it's going to go to the floor for a vote, and all the banks finally want, want to get in. But just so you know, just so you understand something here, the banks have already been working with cannabis industries. Not all of these banks, but there's banks working with cannabis industries. They just charge ridiculous amount of fees and interest in, on, on your dollar. Mm-hmm. Kind of like uh, in Scarface when the banker came back to Tony in, in his office while Tony's doing lines of coke in his office saying, hey, Tony, you're going to have to start paying 42% on oh, every geez. dollar you give us. And Tony, <laughs> Tony goes, you fucking crazy, man? Are you fucking, what do I look like? I got something in my ass here? You know, really just went after the bank. He's like, you can bring it overseas and you get charged even worse and maybe never see your money again. But you got to think, these cannabis companies that are dealing with banks or money holders that yeah. hold them, they're charging them big, fat like, interest. Like a hard money loan. Yeah. They give their money millions of dollars. We, we to, decide the interest rate. Exactly. Cause, cause and you for can, you, it's, not, it's 25%. Yeah, exactly. Have a good day. You we're going to hold money? your money, but we're going to tax you. You want you. the money? You don't want yeah. the money. Yeah. So <laughs> it's just so fucked up. <laughs> Fuck you, pay me, basically, is what they're saying. <laughs> They'll take the tax dollars. Oh, my they? gosh. It's just so ass backwards, I swear. Ugh. It is what month? It is Indigenous Peoples Month. Yay! Yes. So I have a great article on Native American cannabis offering opportunities from coast to coast. So get ready. This is a long one and a good one, and it's really something important to talk about. Uh, states across the U.S. enact legalization while countries like Canada are freeing the plant at a federal level. The business of cannabis has been on an upward trajectory for over a decade, and Native American tribes are claiming space in the cannabis sector, but with a sovereign twist. Tribal, tribal governments hold nation-to-nation -nation agreements with the U.S. government. Indigenous peoples can be called tribes, bands, nations, pueblos, communities, and native villages. Each tribe holds sovereignty over the land where they reside. 
This means that they are self-governing, among other things. Backed by hundreds of treaties, tribal governments built their own governments and passed laws. Those laws are enforced through tribal police and courts. The tribes also establish social services, maintain reservation infrastructure, and work together with state governments. This translates into the cannabis space through altered regulatory operations, and in some places a head start in the journey to adult use. As of 2020, one in three Native Americans faced poverty. With tax dollars filtering fully back into the tribe, cannabis operations appear a promising opportunity for Native Americans. Tribe-to-state relations are highlighted as indigenous cannabis brands pop up coast-to-coast. In recent months, Minnesota has been the topic of a flurry of news stories, starting with Governor Tim Walls signing a bill to legalize adult-use cannabis in May. Legalization was set to be enacted on August 1st, but before then, indigenous tribes in the state were encouraged to hit the ground running. A few days after lending his signatures to the bill, government, Governor Walls spoke about tribes setting frameworks and establishing dispensaries as those following Minnesota state guidelines waited for licenses. My hope is to see them thrive in this industry, Governor Walls told a local news outlet. Since then, tribal dispensary operations have popped up on multiple reservations. Red Lake Nation was the first band of Ojibwe to make adult use sales in Minnesota on August 1st. The opening of Native Care, just east of Grand Forks, was followed quickly by Wabigwan Mashkiki on the White Earth Reservation. The Leech Lake Band came next, formalizing adult-use cannabis on its tribal lands. They are currently finalizing a dispensary location. These shops are on tribal land, but open to non-tribal members. There's an upside of tribe-owned cannabis operations. Over in Washington, tribes have had the option to opt out to opt out in uh, they can opt out in the state legalized adult use in 2012. That didn't make sense, does it? Had the option to opt out in <laughs> oh no, hey, all right, stones. let's just skip that. No, it's just poor. I, I yeah, whatever. <laughs> Cannabis operations. So we're talking about <laughs> Washington. Back in 2012, cannabis operations have popped up on reservations in the Northwest. Still a Guamish is one of the latest to open a shop. After becoming the first Washington tribe with a brewery, expanding their portfolio to pot made sense. The Still a Guamish tribe brought board of directors shared more about the dispensary decision in an email with Green State. The Still a Guamish tribe of Indians has always been very interested in business development. And we are continually working on branching out and diversifying our business enterprises where we see opportunities <coughs> and interest in the community. So I'm going to read that line. Over in Washington, tribes have had the option to opt in since the state legalized adult use in 2012. Thanks. <laughs> mm, that, I couldn't what get those, so I don't know. those words. Was it the have had? Uh, now I'm going to have a choking attack. Oh, gosh. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, we are continually working on branching out and diversifying our business enterprises where we see opportunities and interest in the community. Our businesses help to provide revenue for our many community services, including housing, daycare, and behavioral health services, the board said. Tribes in Washington enter into a compact with the government before starting a canvas operation. The Still Guamish board explained that the cannabis compact echoed many of the same rules and regulations as state regulated businesses, especially regarding public safety. However, they have set guidelines for sales and promotions that aren't permitted in Washington dispensaries. For example, the 210 dispensary can have conditional sales like buy one, get one free. They can host consumption events and they can sell white label products under the dispensary brand at the store. All of these retail tactics are unavailable for shops under operating under state law, but the greatest success falls to the tax revenue. The biggest upside is the fact 
that the state cannot collect excise taxes from us for cannabis sales. We are required to charge a tribal tax, which is at least 100% of the state's tax on cannabis products. But the entirety of that tax goes back to the tribe, allowing us to reinvest in our communities directly. Good for That's them. That's awesome. The Still Guamish Board explained. We do have the ability to waive the tribal tax in certain inst instances, <clears throat> such as for sales of cannabis that was grown or processed within Indian country. So that might be an opportunity we consider in the future. Any points not addressed in the compact are up to the tribe, but still Aguamish has no plans to rock the boat. Every decision at 210 goes through the knowledgeable dispensary management team, the tribe's lawyers, and the board of directors. Through this funnel, it's rare that regulations stray from the norm of cannabis operations within the state. Our aim is to remain as compliant as possible and mitigate risk while sim simultaneously leveraging tribal advantage where appropriate, the board concluded. The Oglala Sioux Tribe, historically known as Oglala Lakota, uh, legalized the plant on the South Dakota Pine Ridge Reservation in March of 2020, over a year before voters approved medical cannabis in the state. Which South Dakota is trying to pull <clears throat> back that law now, so they'll be yeah. right back in business and, and take over again. Trent Hancock is a member of the Oglala Sioux and an Oregon business owner. Hancock explained what makes this tribe-owned cannabis operation special in messages and emails with Green State. He said, the Oglala Sioux Tribe was the first to pass a required small business ordinance. All owners have to be tribal members. No outside investors were allowed. All the businesses were started and funded by tribal members, Hancock said. This means all of the money, not just the tax revenue brought in by tribal dispensaries like Warpath Cannabis, goes right back into the tribe. The census reports that almost 50% of people on the Pine Ridge Reservation are below the poverty line. More tax revenue, job creation, and seeing tribal members flex their logos as entrepreneurs all goes towards trending that number down. This success is celebrated, but it hasn't come without its challenges. Hancock has watched people attempt to enter the tribal's internal affairs with what he perceived as malintent. Hancock recalls an unnamed large corporation trying to enter the market when the tribe first moved to pass cannabis -led reg regulations. That corporation was eventually edged out, but it wasn't the last challenge for a stake in the Oglala Sioux cannabis. We also had a group that was raided on the Navajo reservation that came to our res talking about intertribal commerce, Hancock recalled. They tried to convince our tribe that they could cross state lines with product legally. This group is involved in several tribes and is putting tribes in legal danger. The Oglala Sioux tribe has persisted, though, maintaining full tribal ownership of Pine Ridge Reservation cannabis operations. Their success should be celebrated, but it's also noteworthy to illuminate the challenges tribe-owned cannabis faces across the United States. From state lawmakers and police to corporate cannabis, tribal cannabis operations <coughs> have been halted by non-tribal entities. In 2021, sorry, thirsty, a little dry over here. <laughs> in 2021, police wrongfully raided a farm in Mendocino that sat on the Round Valley Re Indian Reservation. According to an ongoing federal lawsuit, the police destroyed over 100,000 plants. On the other side of the country, in New York, Cannabis Corporation Tilt seized its partnership with the Shinnecock Nation and their dispensary, Little Beach Harvest. In an earnings call, the Tilt CFO cited challenges in the New York market negatively impacting both supply and demand as the reason for the split. Their stake in Little Beach Harvest was sold to developer Power Funds Partners. A Tilt distributed press release expressed only good vibes between the three entities. The Council of Trustees of the Shinnecock Nation voiced thanks to Tilt for breaking ground on the project alongside trust that Power Fund would have the store open this fall. This transition of Power Fund partners will bring us to the point of completion and an official opening as the first tribally owned cannabis dispensary in eastern Long Island on our sovereign land. The council said in a statement, we are excited about what our business will bring to our people 
and the surrounding communities. A few days after the Shinnecock Nation shakeup, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians voted to legalize cannabis for adult use on their reservation in North Carolina. This shook up the state, where cannabis is illegal in all forms. Before the vote, Republican Congressman Chuck Edwards penned an op-ed in Cherokee One Feather, urging tribal members to opt out of legalization in the upcoming election. Two weeks later, Republican Edwards introduced the Stop Pot Act of 2023, come on, dude, which would halt specific federal funds to indigenous tribes that allow adult use cannabis. Despite the opinion piece in which Rep. Edwards stated Congress was gutless and the sovereignty challenging bill, 70% of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians voted yes on adult use cannabis. I think Representative Edwards is gutless. Yeah. The Stop Pot Act of 2023 currently has, go figure, two sponsors, and data gives it a 2% chance of being enacted because it's stupid. Hmm. Native American tribes are making strides in the cannabis space and allocating the tax dollars right back into their communities. From the Stiligwamish people of the Pacific Northwest to the Oglala Lakota on the Great Plains, each tribe has taken its own road to open dispensaries and cultivations with one thing in common, sovereignty. This big word gives indigenous tribes the space to make decisions, though many stay aligned with state regulations. Those that don't have hundreds of treaties to back them up. Native American cannabis operations offer indigenous communities the opportunity of entrepreneurship, a leg up in the cannabis space, and more uh, jobs on the reservation and an avenue out of poverty. It's a win-win. Hell yeah. I think that's great. Take that. We supported one when we went up to Michigan. Yeah, Yeah. that was great. Uh, international news, bill to legalize marijuana in Germany advances after state representatives fail to block it. Good for you, Germany. Get those social clubs open so people can smoke. Uh, cannabis producers can now provide samples to cannabis in British Columbia. Good for you. Dutch cannabis pilot startup phases launch in December over three years late. Oof, <laughs> a little bit late there. And then Thailand. What have I, I've been so proud of you, Thailand, and this is not your fault. Thailand. The new prime minister of Thailand to shut down recreational cannabis. And he's telling the UN he's gonna shut it down and shut down adult use weed. And this is the new the new governing body in Thailand. This prime Minister may stop recreational cannabis use. May. There's a lot of shops and a lot of people doing uh, recreational cannabis in Thailand. Um so we will shall see and keep you all informed on this, but man. Don't fuck this up, Thailand. I've been so proud of you. Fight for your right for cannabis. Wiz Khalifa. Yeah. I like Wiz Khalifa. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What is he not being viewed as? He does not want to be viewed as a stoner anymore. Uh, When Wiz Khalifa burst onto the scene in 2010 with his hit song Black and Yellow, the culture didn't know much about the young man. Born and raised in Pittsburgh, Khalifa was a clean slate. <clears throat> However, through his music and visuals, he quickly made it known that his first love was weed. With his first album, Rolling Papers, boasting tracks such as Roll Up and On My Level featuring Too Short, Khalifa built his brand around weed and was comfortable doing so. From his own line of premium rolling papers to his weed strain, Khalifa Kush, he forged a lane for himself and even developed a friendship with hip-hop's lovable uncle, Snoop Dogg. The two musicians film the stoner comedy Mac and Devin Go to High School and released a collaborative soundtrack. Although Khalifa initially found success with his form of marketing, hip-hop fans grew to see him as one-dimensional artist who made music solely about weed. As such, audiences began to pay less attention to his material and look to more versatile artists. As a result of his introductory marketing, Wiz Khalifa was quickly written off as a stone, a stoner rapper and a pothead, which has highly was de- highly detrimental to his career growth over the years. However, in an interview with Hard Knock TV, the Pennsylvania Act revealed that he is working on detaching himself from that stigma. Speaking to the host, Wiz explained, I was just walking and talking with one of my homies yesterday. I kind of want to break the stigma of everything I do is like a stoner this or a weed head that. 
That's what I built my marketing off of and my brand. But at the end of the day, everyone who is successful in film or in music gets high, and they don't look at them as a stoner. He continued, when I get past this point, I think I'll make more movies and do things different. So people uh, don't look, f so they don't think I look forced or like I'm trying too hard to change lanes or change gears. Well, despite his efforts, he has yet to shake that stoner image that he introduced to the world so early in his career. Many artists have experienced similar problems. 50 Cent tried to shake his gangster image. Azealia Banks tried to detach herself from her rebellious brand. However, first impressions are hard to change. Good luck, Wiz. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah, that is tough. Yep. So uh, Cypress Hills b Real opens fifth Dr. Green Thub's dispensary in West Los Angeles. And the only reason why I mention it is because on the cover of the magazine... Uh, he has a budgie that he's holding oh, yeah. on his on his uh, re one of his records, and it looks exactly like Vega. So oh. I had to read. I thought it was awesome. So, but he was the front man, and he's got a, a, his fifth Doctor Green thumb, which is good for him. Uh, uh, it's great. He's been an advocate for cannabis and weed and marijuana and pot and whatever you call it around the world. I mean, they always on every show they never did not have weed, and they made when they traveled overseas, they made arrangements. They were, I mean, kind of, I mean, he, they always had weed and all their shows were always about weed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, good for them and, uh, for be real and, uh, who's been a big advocate and, uh, still looking good and still singing good to me. So Mrs. Weed man, Mr. Weed man, that's the end of the show. It is. It is. Oh, till we meet again, everybody, Mrs. Weed man, you got anything else to say? Have a great week, everyone. Stay well. And as Polly always says, smoke smart, puff puff in the way. Puff puff pass. Check out our cannabis lifestyle brand online at 8decades.com. Our custom smokes and accessories are perfect for your coffee table, bedroom nightstand, or kitchen counter. They're designed for you to show them off. The Canna community is also loving our hemp and cotton blend t-shirts, sweatshirts, scarves, and hats. Finished off with our 8 Decades logo. We've got some awesome, long-lasting goods that will be your favorite for years to come. Eight decades, because a ninth decade of cannabis prohibition isn't acceptable. 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 Acceptable.